cataract and refractive and retina surgeon, if I can say so. <laughs> and he'll take us through the, uh, the new lens which is there for practice. Dr. Ramamurthy, please. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Chityal. Uh, my uh, premise is to speak on a revolution in trifocal technology, the Acris of uh, Panoptics platform. Relevant to this presentation, I'm a consultant for Alcon, j and and Zeiss, and uh, the product I'm going to be talking about is uh, manufactured and marketed by Alcon. I think the current standards of uh, visual outcomes have completely changed. Today we are concerned about uncorrected visual acuity for all distances, not just for distance, but near and intermediate as well. And the cataract surgery gives us an excellent opportunity to uh, improve the quality of vision that the patient presents with. And what we are concerned about is immediate restoration of vision. And since our patients are living well into their 80s and 90s, and we are operating on persons in their 40s and 50s with a, say, a 6966 six, um, posterior subcapsular cataract, obviously what we do might far outlive our own professional lifetime. So what we do has to serve the patient for an extremely long time. So today, cataract surgery is not just a vision uh, restorative surgery where you remove the opacity, but it's a vision enhancing surgery where it gives you an opportunity to give back the patient the kind of vision that he or she never enjoyed right through their lives. Obviously, in this uh, effort, you would not consider prescribing glasses for a 50-year-old without caressing his presbyopia or his astigmatism. So why place an intraocular lens in a 50-year-old, which is giving him the vision only for distance? Just doesn't make sense. But simply, it's not just the cost factor alone, but it's also the fact that we are not so sure about the quality of vision that these lenses can give. Basically, this is a simple drawing that we have to understand when we are talking about monofocal intraocular lenses. Rays of light are coming from a distance, coming to a precise focus in the, uh, on the fovea. But when it is a multifocal intraocular lens, then the rays of light are also coming uh, uh, from the near point. And this is getting focused in front because of the additional light. And then it is dispersing. What we get here is signal, and what you get here is noise. So basically, it is a signal-to-noise ratio which causes dysphotopsia. And most of the advances in current uh, multifocal technology has taken place towards reducing this signal-noise ratio. The other factor that we are not sure about is whether we can promise patients from spectral independence. It is often said that you talk to have a significant uh, session with the patient, identify whether what he or she prefers, wants to use a computer, or wants to read, or wants to cook, or wants to play golf. Damn it, given a choice, I would like to do all of it. So is there an opportunity to do all of it? So obviously, we have moved forward in this direction. And uh, that's where the panoptics comes in. And as you can see over here, how is it different from the restore multifocal intraocular lenses that was available to us for quite some time, and it was serving us very well. Basically, what we have in the restore is a single LAD. Earlier, it was plus four diopters, and now we have the low ad multifocals of plus 2.5 or three diopters. And a three diopter ad uh, translates to a 2.25 diopters ad power. And in its 2.5, it's good for intermediate, but quite inadequate for near. But we have been doing a micro monovision, playing around with the powers that we implant with the two eyes, and thus creating a reasonably good outcome once bilaterally implanted. When we have the panoptics, a trifocal intraocular lens, what you essentially have is a 2.38 diopters at the spectacle plane, more like the 2.5 diopters that we prescribe in our pseudophagic patients who have received a monofocal intraocular lens. And for intermediate vision, you have a plus 1.63 diopters at the spectacle plane. So by this, and uh, uh, naturally the distance vision correction of plus 20, 21, or whatever the basic power is there. So obviously this takes care of all the vision for all distances. And some of the other differences are that you had a 3.6 millimeter diffractive zone in the uh, plus three diopter with the plus 2.5 is uh, 3.4 millimeters. Here it becomes 4.5 millimeters. The number of diffractive rings has also changed in the sense that instead of nine rings, now we have 15 rings. And most importantly, the central zone, which was smaller, the, the target area was essentially for near. And here what you have is for intermediate. And then it alternates from intermediate, near distance, near intermediate, near distance, so that there's a good distribution of light for all uh, distances. And more again, it's no, no longer upper dice, but it's a non-upper dice lens that we have. 
and an extremely important point that I missed was the with this 3.6 millimeter diffractive zone and out of this outside this the lens being refractive essentially it said that when you have to read in dim light conditions like you are reading a menu card in a restaurant or something maybe the vision was a little inadequate that's the reason the full diffractive lenses which had all over six millimeters might have been preferable in those instances but then they came with a spin-off effect that the quality of vision deteriorated once you had more number of diffractive rings here because you have 4.5 millimeters that seems to be inherent advantage in the sense when you have less than four millimeters you are compromising on near vision in dim light conditions when you have more than five millimeters your diffractive rings all across the optics of the lens you are compromising on the quality of vision when the patient goes out in the evenings when the pupils are expanding so 4.5 millimeters seems to be a good wire media where we take care of a good quality near vision at the same time without compromising the distant vision uh, too much but having said that there's no multifocal that's available which can completely do away with dysphotopsia because you whenever you use a multifocal you are buying uh, vision for all distances using the currency of contrast it's only the money you spend that becomes less and less as technology advances let's look at the optics of this lens when you have a monofocal lens it's a the, from a distance light being brought into a precise focus onto the fovea but then you have a, obviously in this case you would require additional um, and um, add power in your spectacles for reading when it comes to a multifocal lens then you have the distance being in brought into precise focus you have just a multifocus essentially bifocals you have a second focus which is at 40 30 or 25 centimeters depending upon the add power in the lens whether it's plus four diopters plus 3.5 or plus three diopter or 2.5 diopters so because this is the reason that the patient has to pick and choose as to what distance he or she wants to look at or if you want to serve them uh, um, adequately you have to mix and match these lenses or sometimes do a blended vision so that bilaterally implanted they are able to do this so obviously the right way to go would be something which takes care of distance vision intermediate vision and near vision and that's what this that's where the trifocal comes in and this is the conventional trifocals like something of the zeiss uh, trifocals or the um, the biovision the uh, the other trifocal that's available so here what you have is layers of light coming into focus from distance and then you have from 40 centimeters then you have from 80 centimeters there are essentially two dif diffractive patterns one is the, the basic power of the lens and one for distance and one for intermediate and one for near so why is this uh, 40 and 80 centimeters why not in between why can't we have 25 45 65 etc it's simply because of the age-old Thomas Young's principle that diffraction where when you have two foci to a light coming in from two foci and uh, interacting you have areas of darkness areas of light areas where th they tend to cancel out each other and areas where they uh, superimpose on each other and when you, the areas where they superimpose are where we have the precise foci and that's uh, this can only be double of each other you can have 40 80 120 160 but not numbers in between so this was a 80 centimeters what what were the intermediate vision but this was somewhat inadequate in the sense that if you have to read it obviously when you're looking at a computer or your or, uh, iphone or something you are going to hold it in your hand and for a person's arm length to be 80 centimeters he has to be six feet eight inches tall but most of us are in the range of five to six feet so obviously bringing it closer would be a better idea and that's the reason that instead of 80 centimeters 60 centimeters might be a better idea and that's exactly what is achieved by the panoptics and how does it do it basically you have 40 centimeters that you have triple of that that is 120 centimeters and they half it back to make it 60 centimeters what exactly is optics is may some seems to be proprietary information which is not completely available to us but this is the basic premise that do so it's essentially a quadrifocal lens where you have from distance 40 60 120 and how it becomes a trifocal is when from the 120 centimeters you transmit light back to the distance and you just have the uh, light coming into focus from 40 to 60 centimeters and 60 centimeters seems to be the right distance as far as the intermediate distance is concerned and the good news is that uh, when i was using extended depth of vision lenses the low add multifocals i had to do emphasize on bilateral surgery 
mix and match, etc. But here, even unilaterally implanted, these patients seem to be doing quite well. So uh, just skipping that slide. Basically, the other good thing is that 88% of the light is utilized in this compared to 82% with multifocal lenses. Does that 6% really make a big difference? It does. It's not because the 6% that's lost, but it's the light which is lost, which is responsible for dysphotopsia, for deteriorating the quality of vision. When it comes down from 18% to 12%, you're saving up, improving the quality of vision by almost 33%. Uh, and secondly, as far as distribution is concerned, it's 50% for distance, 25% for intermediate, and 25% for near. And look at this. Uh, this is for the conventional bifocal where you have um, in the defocus curve, good vision for distance and a considerable dip. And it is, depending upon the ad power in the lens, you have a certain peak which is quite far away from this. In between them, this, you do not have a good vision. When it comes to panoptics, right from 40 centimeters to 80 centimeters, you seem to have a reasonably good quality of vision right through. Just showing a very small video of, on this uh, lens being implanted. You can see over here, that's uh, basically the tried and tested IQ platform, which has been implanted world over for about 100 million eyes. Yellow pigment is incorporated. And then you have a square edge all around. It goes comfortably goes in through a 2.2 millimeter incision. A well done FACO emulsification, LRCS. And you can see those 15 rings over there. And uh, the implantation of this lens is no different from the conventional lenses. And uh, uh, recently, the panoptic toric has also become available. And this is a, a case I did recently. No different, I have the Varion overlay which is not showing up in the microscopic display. And you can see those uh, uh, toric markings over there. And that's the, uh, uh, because of this, especially when you talk about multifocals, uh, taking care of uh, cylinder is extremely important. And this uh, lens available from T2 to T6 allows you to do that. We have done about 55 eyes with three months follow up, 18 bilateral and 19 unilateral eyes. Their uh, average age was 60, uh, male, female, uh, minimum males, not of great significance. The, uh, we really enjoyed the excellent results as far as distance visual equity is concerned. 64% of them achieved 20 by 20, 100% achieved 20, 40 or better. This is because we did not have the toric version available to us, so there was some residual cylinder left over. Now that toric has become available, these results are bound to improve. And when you look at the post-operative uncorrected visual equity, 96% of them reached preoperative best corrected visual acuity and 89% of them improved. Obviously, you expect that because you're doing a cataract surgery. And as far as spherical equivalent is concerned, within 0.5 diopters and 93%, within one diopter, 100%. And cylinder correction, because we preoperatively selected such a way, that uh, gain was quite insignificant. And uh, the good news is that intermediate vision uh, eight, uh, eyes, eight eyes, I'm not talking about patients, once bilaterally implanted this bound to improve, had a little bit of a, a difficulty in intermediate vision, but the good news, 88% of the patients are absolutely comfortable for all distances, even after unilateral implantation. When I was doing other multifocals, it was always a significant conversation about improving your vision with the second eye, but here, single eye implanted, you are able to achieve an excellent quality of vision. So that's, uh, and uh, the other good thing is the very mild halos on two patients. As I said, you, do no, you can't just wish away dysphotopsia, but it significantly drops down. So finally, uh, I think uh, panoptics is a great new addition to the armamentarium that we have, designed for more natural adaptability, comes with these exceptional features uh, that uh, extremely high light neutralization, that is 88% of the light is utilized, designed for good intermediate as well as near vision, intermediate at 60 centimeters, less dependence on pupil size and on a proven Acrisoft uh, platform. Obviously, you have to differentiate yourself, and I believe that differentiating <coughs> yourself with the panoptics is a great way to go. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Ramamurthy. I think uh, the generation has shifted from a bifocal to multifocal, that is trifocal Why now. And rightly said, uh, the available designs, materials, concepts would uh, give us a, a, a thinking towards shifting to a, a vision which is comfortable to patient. And these trifocal lenses uh, from Alcon uh, Panoptics uh, is one of the best available lenses today with us for a patient's benefit also. Whatever we have used, the distance visual acuity, 
and the near intermediate is, is uh, very good. Uh, looking into a contrast for these patients are also uh, far better than uh, the bifocal lens that we had uh, in our uh, practice now. I think we have to shift to our trifocal lenses. And uh, with, as rightly said, uh, once a toric has come up now, that things have become much more uh, comfortable. We can accept these lenses for a wider range of patients with uh, toric platform also. We invite uh, uh, now the talk on toric IOLs, uh, which will be uh, covered by Dr. Suhas Haldipurkar. And uh, he has a huge experience in, uh, as a training teacher in the field of uh, FACO. And trifocal is uh, one of the, I think, best practice we have for the last almost two decades now. Dr. Suhas, please. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, the question is why one should incorporate toric IOLs into their practice? It's, uh, it's very uh, funny that there was a time when torics were looked at, uh, you know, harmless enemies. But now with, uh, you know, the premium lenses, uh, it's no more so. The cataract surgery treatment has reached the zenith where everything is taken care to achieve the utopia in visual happiness. Along with rapid visual rehab, many patients express their desire to, to be spectacle free after surgery. In today's scenario, the average age of patients is coming down. So that makes it uh, all the more reason. And if you want the youthful clear vision, you know, uh, there are certain things because we have moved from spherical IOLs to zero aspheric to uh, negative aspheric lenses. The journey continued from monofocals to refractive multifocals to diffractive, and now it continues to be, continues into extended range and trifocals, and the astigmatism continues to remain one of the minor irritants on the way to achieve the ultimate goal. Corneal astigmatism is not very rare. It's, it's a significant proportion of patients, and some studies have put it at 22 to 25 percent. Some studies say more have small or more of astigmatism, and uh, that's the reason. And why are we bothered about astigmatism? Because it decreases the quality of vision. Uh, there is a meridional blur, the starburst and glare, and there is obviously diplopia. The advent of multifocal and trifocal lenses will require the pre-existing corneal astigmatism, even if it's small uh, amount, to be addressed if the patient has to achieve spectacle independence. O over the years, astigmatism has been corrected either with spectacles, contact lenses, arcuate keratotomies. We have used toric, we have used LASIK, and uh, uh, here we are talking about a single procedure giving us. With ECC, the wound was large, there was no question the you know um, the healing was unpredictable and with FACO uh, you know we have started going smaller and smaller uh, with obviously we thought we have minimal SI and uh, there was a rebirth of incisional astigmatism correction uh, LRI or um, uh, arcuate keratotomies but then doing FACO with LRI for astigmatism the results are uh, at best unpredictable there's always a regression there is tectonic instability in question, and uh, it is very difficult to titrate either small or big. The toric lenses today is the main stay for management of cataract surgery because it is accurate, consistent, and predictable. And if you look at the studies, the percentage of extremely satisfied patients is 80% if post-op astigmatism is less than 0.5. And if the astigmatism goes little above 0.5, the extremely satisfied patient percentage rapidly drops down. Now, there is obviously higher patient expectation. There is increasing use of toric lenses. And toric lenses, in fact, today are used for even for a small cylinder. That's the reason we have the T2 series, which is very much used by many surgeons who wish to achieve 6566 six after uh, multifocal lenses. Our role in toric lenses uh, to minimize all possible sources of error if you want to get final result at 0.5. And it's very systematic that a patient, when he comes and you diagnose to have astigmatism, he goes through certain distinct stations. First, his biometry is done. In between, his counseling is done then there's a transcription, then you have the planning stage, 
then you have the marking stage just before the surgery, then the issue of cyclotorsion that has to be taken into account, then we have the SIA that is caused by your incision size, you have the rexis which has to be central, circular and overlapping the lens, then after that finally you have to position the lens accurately and uh, uh, if you really still can't, there, is, there has to be some amount of optimization. So that means at every stage there can be a lot of errors. Now if it is pre-op keratometric measurements, gone are the days when we use one machine to do that. Like you have to use more than one and kind of uh, assess with your personal experience as to which particular case to be taken. I cannot uh, overemphasize any uh, question about corneal topography because we know that if you want astigmatoric lenses to work well, your astigmatism has to be a regular one. Asymmetric ones probably won't give you good results. Toric IOL calculations today are done with several formulas. Each uh, company will have its own online calculator. But today, uh, among all, the universal Barrett online Toric calculator seems to be giving you the best results, and most of us are on it. In your um, online calculator, they'll ask you for uh, whether in to include posterior corneal astigmatism because that's another issue that we have to be looking at, and then the surgically induced astigmatism because there's a lot that we know today about surgical astigmatism, induced astigmatism. At the start, it was considered insignificant for clear corneal phaco incisions, and then we learned that we still induce even at a small incision and it ranged from 0.3 to 0.5. This began to be incorporated into toric calculators so that you know we don't miss out. And the SIA was calculated by taking the difference between post-op K and pre-op K and the calculate, SIA calculation, calculation, calculation was done by using the vector analysis. And for example, after that we realized that around 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5 uh, kind of uh, SIA we were getting. But what we didn't realize is that there was a fundamental drawback. The, we always thought an incision would cause relaxation, relaxation in the same axis. But now we know that a in given incision at temporal may not give you a relaxation in the same axis. It can still be in any of the axis. And that's the reason what we do is we go for centroid value which is calculated by deriving the mean value from vector analysis and it does, it does it with a double angle plot. And this centroid value should be considered for SIA and uh, you can use different formulas and today uh, for most of us, if you're taken care with a good incision, your uh, SIA comes as low as 0.1 because that's the mean. Then there is another factor which is posterior corneal elastigmatism because most keratometers use only the measure from the anterior surface. But the logic tells us that, the common sense tells us that if the anterior cornea is toric, there's likely to be some toricity on the posterior cornea as well. And this fact was completely ignored earlier. And PC surface, <coughs> the posterior corneal surface is always steeper vertically than horizontally and because it's a minus lens, Dilated a vertical state. steepness will create plus refractive power along the horizontal, which in turn means if you're calculating for your uh, 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 toric power, you have to slightly undercorrect with the rule astigmatism or overcorrect against the rule astigmatism to neutralize the PCA. PCA can actually be measured by oculizer or pentacam, but uh, what we normally do is our online calculators will take it into consideration. When using conventional keratometers, PCA accounted for in calculation can always be taken care with the you know, formulas that we use. So ask you have two, two minutes. Okay, so when we come to OT, there's always a pre-op marking and at every place like in this, you could use freehand marking and freehand marking at six o'clock, which is more common with most of us. Then we have the sources in the intraop period where the Mendis marker may not be at the accurate place or your mark could be a little smudgy or your rexis is big and the lens is slightly decenter. And that's the reason we have what, what we call as a markerless system, which is a very systematic image planning and guide. 
and that's a very on system where all the hassle of marking it pre-op, uh, setting um, you know position is all gone. You just take the patient, make a circular axis which is central and which is uh, which tells you how much size to be taken. So in conclusion, what we know today is that astigmatism by its nature decreases vision quality for both near and far. And the correction of astigmatism provides a great and noticeable patient to the uh, benefit to the patient. It helps a cataract surgeon achieve results which satisfy both him and the patient. And we, what we should remember is that astigmatic correction during cataract surgery is a medical necessity. And with evolution in toric oil practice, toric lenses should be the method of choice in correcting astigmatism with cataract surgery. Thank you so much. I think uh, Dr. Suha has very comprehensively covered the topic. And uh, he, not only about the lens, but he dwelt upon various aspects that you need to be uh, taken into consideration. And uh, the good news is that you don't really have to worry your head about all those uh, compensations, the uh, toricity ratio, et cetera, where depending upon the base power of the lens, the uh, power of the toricity also changes. And as he mentioned, Barrett toric calculator seems to be the best way to go. And the Alcon toric calculator has this incorporated. So when you are submitting your data for your toric calculation, it's done on the Barrett toric calculator so you can accept it. Only thing is the SIA that we used to mention as 0 0.3, 0 0.4 diopters, today we feed in as 0 0.1 diopter because we take in the centroid value. You might have reservations about multifocals, et cetera, because of quality of vision, but using toric lenses is a no-brainer. Just like you won't prescribe glasses without correcting <laughs> cylinders, I think as a modern-day cataract surgeon, you must uh, correct toricity whenever it's indicated. Uh, next, we have another stalwart, Dr. Jeevan Titial. Uh, from All India Institute of Medical Sciences, taught uh, so many uh, young surgeons, cataract and refractive surgery, talking to us about the ultra cert preload IOL. Uh, thank you. Uh, before that, uh, I just wanted to highlight the design of uh, IOLs, which will have a stability uh, in the back, which is so important for toric IOLs. I think the Alcon uh, the open loop designs are one of the best designs possible for a toric IOLs today. And the rotation after you implant with these lenses are hardly there. So that is, I think, one of the most important feature of uh, Alcon lenses, where you do have a, a very nice stability of these lenses. Whenever you implant toric IOLs, uh, we look for a st stability not only on the table, subsequently in the post-op period also. And people have found that first few hours of surgery is very important to look into your patient and see if your lens is in the proper place. And once the patient crosses a day one or so, the things doesn't change much, unless you have not removed the viscoelastic properly. So surgical technique is also very important for achieving good toric IOL implantation for your patients. We discuss on the panoptic lenses, one of the best lenses possible today. You talked about toric lenses, but the way we inject these lenses are also very important so that you achieve good results for these cases. I, I do not have any financial uh, disclosure to be made here. Looking into the eye wells, per se, in 1949, we all know we had our first female lenses who came. Subsequently, 1967, Charles Kelman, who made the NOFACO uh, available for people. So once we had a FACO in around 1980s, we started having first foldable lenses. The first foldable lenses would give you a definite advantage of uh, making incision smaller, because we all desire to have a small incision for our patients. So you have a manual folding where you require a folder, folder forceps here. Then you had a monarch system coming up. And then subsequently we had auto cert, uh, which is a motorized system. Now you have a preloaded designs coming in picture. One of the benefits of uh, having a small incision, we all know, a small incision will give you a sutureless advantage. It will give a early rehabilitation because the wound will not shift subsequently. You have a refractive stabilization. And most importantly, the leakage may not be there, therefore the chances of endothelmitis will decrease in these patients. But I think the incision is governed by uh, two important things. The one is the type of IOL. You have a rigid lens, you have to have a large incision. If you have a smaller foldable lenses, you have a small incision. Second thing is how we inject these lenses. So these are two important aspects which can make the difference in the incision size. If today, if I can inject my lenses through one millimeter incision, my surgical incision will go to one millimeter. Because the FACO machine, the tips 
or such a design we can be used in less than two millimeter also. And you know that drawbacks for a manual injective systems are there. Sometimes they are not very smooth, they are jerky, and most importantly, they can uh, have a slightly longer duration surgeries. And importantly, looking for a TAS and endothelmitis can be there because manual injection, there's a surface of the IOL can touch the ocular surface, and you have a larger area of contact with the ocular surface. The bacteria can get adherent to the surface because these are all hydrophobic surface. Therefore, you have a higher chances of a delayed uh, endothelitis in your patients. Therefore, there's a need for a preloaded designs which have a I will inside the uh, cartridge. This is how uh, Alcon has gone through their uh, delivery systems. If you look into 1998, they had a Monarch system coming up. In 2002, they had a C cartridge. 2007, they had a D cartridge. In 2011, they came with the auto surge. In 2015, they have now preloaded de device ultra surge, and now recently they are coming out with the autonomy. So these are things which have changed the concept of IOL injection in, in these cases. This is one of my trifocal patients recently done. See uh, what has happened here. Two things are important in a manual injection. One is a phosphorus mark. You can see a small phosphorus mark here. If this comes to the optical area, that it, it can cause a decrease in our optical quality of lens. Second thing, small edge damage because of manual injections. So these are two important things which can happen directly damaging to the IOL apart from the surface getting in contact with the ocular surface also. This is a study by Jones et al. where they uh, looked into a preloaded lenses and their advantage over the uh, routine lenses. They found preloaded lenses were faster. They had a lesser chances of damage and the surgery was faster. Entire the system in the OR was faster and that made uh, things much better. This is a study from Tung et al. They also compared various devices and they found that preloaded devices were faster, more predictable, and relatively uh, less OBD was injected inside the eye. Because that is also important. When we inject the eye well, we fill the entire bag with a viscoelastic. So if you have too much of fill, the extra viscoelastic can be uh, hampering for uh, your injection eye wells. These are the main characteristic of uh, preloaded devices or any eye well devices should be which is there in these cases. So you have uh, preloaded devices, which has the advantage of consistency, predictability, and control insertion IOL. And uh, it's also disposable. I think that is one important thing. The surgery should be, uh, the items which are used should be totally disposable so that don't you reuse them to de decrease the chance of task in these patients. Subsequently, it should save the time of surgeon because saving time is a getting better result for your patients. And ultimately, it should eliminate the handling damage, which I showed in one of my cases as such. So you have both hydrophilic and hydrophobic devices, lenses, which are now available in the preloaded uh, category. In fact, now all lenses are coming in preloaded devices also. And you know that <coughs> Ultrasart is from Alcon. You have a Hoya, you have a Jai system. They all come in the preloaded device systems. This is what a comparative chart is there. You can have a push technique or you have a, a screw technique. Sometimes they can be combined together also. Push will have a better control. Screw will have your one hand is not free. Both hands has to be in the system. As I said, you have a, a, a different sizes, which can range from a 2.2 to 2.8. I think 2.2 is currently is the desired size for most of the eye wells. And Al Alcon ultrasound lenses are there, there in that regard with all the advantages of push technique in these cases. So this is their system which has uh, uh, initial guard, which normally prevents the IOL to be damaged. Then you have second guard, which will be there subsequently, which doesn't allow the plunger to push when the lens is packages. And third is a, a beautifully uh, uh, designed system of uh, tension glide, which gives you a control push of your lens when you're injecting these lenses. So this is what you have a plunger here, which is going to push the lens in a uniform manner because of a tensile guide so that you have a uniformity and predictability of injection in these cases. So you have fast preparation, consistent folding, and unfolding through the small incision in these patients, and you desire to have a secure delivery of lens inside the eye. Just to have one animation uh, the ultra of video. The delivery system is ready to use in three simple steps, what marked is? by blue action indicators. First, fill the front chamber with an approved viscoelastic. Second, remove the lens stop and plunger lock. 
Finally, advance the preloaded Atrosoft IQ intraocular lens into the haptic check position, where it's ready for inspection and implantation. The UltraCert device is also designed to provide a smooth injection experience. The unique spring-loaded plunger and streamlined interior structures are built to deliver the ideal amount of resistance for smooth gliding action. But the most important aspect of any delivery system is surgical consistency. The plunger tip of the UltraCert device is engineered to ensure the trailing haptic remains tucked throughout insertion and the UltraCert nozzle features a proprietary depth guard that's designed to control insertion depth and minimize wound stretch while guiding the intraocular lens through an incision as small as 2.2 millimeters. Simple, smooth, consistent. Let's see the actual uh, video. This is one of my video where uh, you can see uh, you have an IOCT attachment also. And uh, just coming back to the video here again, I'll just run. So normally I would do a clear corneal incision and you can see the a uniplanar incision which has been made, very smooth incision here. Subsequently lens is uh, placed there, I'm uh, moving with the plunger on. The movement has to be slow so that your both haptics are well oriented inside the cartridge. And you can see how clear, you can see everything through the cartridge which is the uh, advantage of this system. Subsequently we are going to do, a, uh, you can see here how smoothly it fits into the corneal incision here and implant inside and it will go very smoothly. And this injection, because as tensile glide, it gives you a very nice uh, orientation of your uh, uh, position force. Subsequently, lens opens inside the anterior chamber. With this plunger, you can still manipulate your lens inside also. That's the advantage. Plunger can go inside more than three millimeters and lens can be done very, very effectively in these cases. One of the most important aspects of any injection is to look for a what type of wound integrity you get from these injections. And that can be seen in the IOCT picture clearly here. Just see the integrity of wound here. Very smooth, uh, both uh, lips of wound are very smooth. There are no damage to the posterior aspect of a wound where you can have a wound side detachment, detachment. And the enlargement of a wound is also not significant. Just see here, this is the configuration which you see here very nicely opposed wound area also. So these are important aspects of any injector system which can give you. They are, uh, delivery is faster, less than one minute. The enlargement of uh, wound will be consistent in terms of delivery wise also. Because of tensile strength, your force is almost regularly equal during the push in the entire lens. That is very important aspect. Incision size remains smaller. The increase in the smaller uh, incision size is smallest with the ultrasound lenses, which is less than a 0.1 millimeter. These are various studies which have proved that these are uh, lenses which has advantage in terms of decreasing the surgically induced astigmatism. Because there are various factors which can increase the SIA. One of them is the IOL injector system. So our experience says that they are very, very fast, safe, smooth uh, delivery systems. And in my practice, I've seen that wound side decimal detachment is hardly there with these uh, ultrasound uh, devices. And there was no way we had a failed IOL delivery, which can happen in the manual injection also. Op optic and haptic uh, relationship was perfectly in these lenses, and no damage was associated with these lenses in terms of indoor and TAS also. This is one uh, uh, slide I've made. This is ultrasound in the left side, and your D card in the, in, in the other side. Once you have a, this guard at three millimeters, so you have only three millimeter, you can go inside the wound area. But there are situations where you have a posterior capsule rupture, you have a distorted anatomy of both the anterior posterior capsule, you like to inject lens far inside. In that situation, the wound enlargement may, may be required, and here it may be a little larger. In that way, I'll feel they have to maybe think of uh, this guard little smoother so that you can manipulate a difficult situation also. Though the plunger can go inside, plunger can manipulate, but the lens entry is not that far off. To summarize, uh, entire ultrasound design, easy and fast delivery, and uh, it can, as I said, less than one minute is the delivery time, predictable IOL unfolding in the, in the eye, and the incision is smallest possible, least extension of a, uh, incision happening in these patients, and minimize the error in the surgical uh, OR area also.
And because you have a better delivery, better timing, better suited for our entire OR staff also. Thank you for kind listening. I think I, we have another speaker uh, who's come here. Any questions we'll take subsequently. Can I invite Dr. Hari Priya to uh, take over the dice and uh, talk about uh, the uh, newer things in terms of outcome wise? Can you load in this uh, paper? How many people have experience of uh, uh, preloaded lenses? Okay, how many have used Alcon preloaded devices? Okay, other preloaded devices? Okay, so which one you have used, sir? OER. OER, Matrix Plus, sir, and Alcon. Okay, any other devices? Okay, what about uh, Jais, Lucia? So it shows that uh, people have access to the you know, preloaded designs. So it's nothing new. But, uh, but the important thing is to have a consistency with any device you are using. So you may get used to one device, but that device should be comfortable to a surgeon in terms of adaptability and more so for your staffs. Because most often the surgeon do, doesn't do all these things. It does, it's done by staff. And I know the staffs have to be trained so uh, we would request all the people who are coming with these lenses, they should get a one session with the OR staff also so that we don't you know, unnecessarily aware of it and doesn't damage the system uh, because of unawareness of how to handle these cases. Any problem you face uh, uh, with these devices? Dr. Balla? Yes, sir. Uh, as you said, it is very safe and predictable. But at times I find sometimes the leading haptic Instead of getting uh, folded, it, it, it goes straight inside. I, I don't know why this happens. Okay, I think, you know, some, some, most of the time, because there are two types. One is, you know, dry uh, preloaded devices like Alcon, or sometimes you have hydrophilic lenses, they are wet devices also. Dry devices, sometimes they are kept in a temperature where lens may not be in a right temperature to, you know, get into a shape. Whenever injecting lenses, when you inject viscoelastic, make sure you inject a good viscoelastic in these cases. I normally use uh, a viscode or a dispersive viscoelastic, which is smoother, unlike uh, other type of viscoelastic. I don't use methyl cellulose in these patients because that it can coat the lens, it can coat the surface also. You have a pigmentation coming into the various areas. So you wait for some time, inject viscoelastic very carefully in the entire uh, area of preloaded area, up to the lens uh, area. Then when, when you're pushing the lens, be a little slow. Give the chance to lens to occupy the space which is meant for them when you're pushing. So that is very important. When you push very fast, then uh, haptics may not be in a proper position. The little time should be given, around six to seven seconds is a given time for these lenses. Dr. Haripiriya? I think I'm still uh, struggling on this. <laughs> any, any more questions on our toric IOLs? Sometimes they use uh, saline and instead of the viscoelastic. Okay, yeah, even that can be done. Uh, that's not a problem, but viscoelastic will have a better uh, retention a better coating of surface. Because the, these plastic devices, they are also hydrophobic surface. And IOL, if gets dry, is again hydrophobic. If both are hydrophobic, then you're going to have problems. That is the area where you can have a scratch marks and other things. You want to back? वैसे भी चल जाएगा आगे है इसके बाद ठीक है
¿Qué estás? Ah, sí, 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 So what this does for the surgeon is you have more surgical comfort because you have better chamber stability. So you also have some other advantages with this new uh, fluid system. You have a dual pump technology. You have two sensors. And even the board is a little lesser, smaller board compared to the uh, early generation of uh, FMS. So uh, this is a FACO being done on a white lens. The target intraocular pressure set here is at 40 millimeters. Uh, and this, you know, as you know, the goal here in a white lens is to have a very stable chamber. Once your excess is done, the torsional ultrasound is about 60. So in the early generation machines, we would have it at 100 with infinity. But here, with this balance tip, you can set your uh, energy levels to about 60. So a vertical chop is being done. And you can see that, you know, the comfort is there because of the good chamber stability. The pieces tend to come float towards the tip. This is a 2.2 millimeter incision. And uh, this uh, uh, is also an ultra sleeve. And uh, with the combination of the, you know, the right fluidics and the right energy, phaco emulsification becomes a lot more comfortable. So this is the balance tip. So the earlier the intrepid tip, the stroke length was about 130. Here it's about 190. So that what it means is your cutting is much, much, much better. So if especially with hard lenses. So with normal cataracts, you won't see the difference much. But if you the harder lenses you, you handle, you find the cutting is much better. And it's also safer because there's less movement of the tip at the wound. Now this is a harder cataract. So when dealing with hard lenses, one has to be aware to maybe be more careful to make a little larger capsule or excess so that there's more working space. Again, in these case cataracts, I would like to use uh, this coat. So you have this dispersive on the endothelia, endothelium. So that will ensure you don't have much of endothelial cell loss. So the phaco chop technique, a small burrow is made. And then the chopper is placed in front and the nucleus is separated. I would like to have more of the tip exposed here. So you can see here how well you can actually hold. So this holdability comes you know, when you have a good uh, uh, cutting, you will also be able to hold deeper and hold firm. So use a vacuum appropriately to hold on to this nucleus and then you use your chopper to separate it. So this to me is a big advantage of the Centurion system to have this better cutting along with the fluidic system. So the target IOP is set at about 60 millimeters and this is equivalent to about 80 bottle height. So normally with the infinity I would use about 110 bottle height. Uh, so once the nucleus is fit into half, the nucleus has to be broken into even smaller fragments, as small as possible. So when dealing with hard lenses, one has to be careful to emulsify, to do phaco as far away from the cornea as possible, more at the iris plane. And using a dispersor, using both of this and using less energy as you need, will ensure you have a clear cornea post-op day one with the right technique and technology. So towards the last piece, I would bring my settings down. Here it's about 35 uh, aspiration flow rate and uh, five 600 vacuum, but you would bring it down for the last piece. Energy here is about 12.96. So this is one big advantage I see. Earlier, uh, the infinity, I would have energy of about 28, 30 in these hard lenses. Here it's about maximum I see is about 16, even with the very dense cataracts. This is a hypermature cataract. Uh, to me, the most difficult a cataract uh, to emulsify is probably a hypermature, a little more difficult than a subluxated as well. Because one, rexus ha you obviously have to take more care. You have a fibrose capsule here. Uh, but more importantly, the nucleus is very hard and it is free, free in the capsular bag. And if you don't use your fluidics and your parameters and your technique appropriately, you may just aspirate the entire capsular bag as well. So for us to even get a hole, to be able to lollipop this uh, kind of a dense cataract, you'll have to have good cutting. So that's why retracting the sleeve so you have more of the tip exposed will ensure you have a good hold. So hold on the lower half of the nucleus, if possible, lower third of the nucleus, and continue to hold as you chop. 
Uh, again, you don't have the epinucleus crucial and you have a smaller nucleus, so this tends to revolve in the bag. So, and also you can kind of flip. So having that absolutely stable chamber enables us to ensure that you are able to have the procedure go under control. So if your chop is not complete, I would always like to go back, hold again. So hold, release it, hold deeper in the lower third, place your chopper just in front of it, go all the way down. As you continue to uh, build your, have your vacuum, so here it's about 500, 550. So as you continue to do, then you separate it layer by layer, so your additions are completely broken. And then you would emulsify it. Again, hypermature cataracts are, you know, we tend to see them more in elderly. So which means you also have less endothelial cell count. You may have less endothelial cell count. So being aware of the cornea uh, will be important to use the right visco and have the right technique. So just like how you can use the centurion for in settings where you need high parameters, like in hard cataracts, you can also use it very well in settings where you need to have low parameters, like a posterior polar cataract or a subluxated cataract. So in this lens, subluxated, it is the cataract, as you can see, is large. It is hard. Uh, and here, there's not much space to even insert the capsule tension ring. I would like to place a CTR from the sideboard. This gives me more control to do it manually than use the automated uh, injector for the CTR. I always support the capsular bag first and then use the CTR so there is not much of wobbling as the CTR is being implanted. And with this support, both at the equator with the CTR and anteriorly with the hooks, then the chop is more comfortable. So here the intraocular pressure is 40. So which is much more, normally I would use 55, 60 as the target IOP. I would go much lower with the IOP here so that there is not too much of pressure on the zonal apparatus and the vacuum and flow are also reduced. So there is no chamber fluctuation. So surge should not be a factor. So the goal here is to have very safe parameters at the same time, it has to be very uh, effective. So if you're going to you know, have very low parameters and not, if it doesn't cut, then you're going to probably use more fluid, which will hydrate the vitreous more, increase your positive pressure, make the uh, whole procedure more difficult. So with these parameters, low parameters also, you can see the how effective it is for the cutting. So have a good hold, the lower half, and gently separate it all the time, being aware that the zonules are weak and also try to avoid having any uh, movement of the phaco tip at the side where you have the zonular loss. So the fragments are broken into as small pieces as possible. So this way again, you don't have much of endothelial damage. So reduce it, subchop it. Even if you have a bigger piece, hold it, make it as small as you would need to, and then emulsify the fragments. So using these hooks are extremely useful during FACO as well, not just for inserting CTR, but during FACO as well. Otherwise, you'll find the bag will be wobbling and you'll have a higher chance of vitreous prolapse. So the ho whole goal is you don't want to have vitreous prolapse during the surgery. So this shows like a 40 IOP corresponds to about 54 bottle height. So you're having a very safe uh, anti-chamber depth and lower IOP. So I think we just heard about the auto -cert. So I think in summary, using a combination of both the active fluidics and the balanced energy definitely takes us one step ahead in dealing with these challenging cataracts. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Haripriya. I think looking into uh, uh, the current trends in our, you know, cataract surgery, I think the entire uh, game is uh, basically to get oriented to uh, the system we are using. Every system may be good in your hands, and that has to be made better in your hand by practice. And looking to advancement, I think in the FACO system, uh, we have active fluidics, which has really made a change for us. And balance tip, along with that, uh, the fluidics have been uh, fantastic for uh, as rightly shown by Dr. Haripiriya. In a difficult situation, also, you can manage very effectively the FACO in these cases. And uh, I will delivery system, there has to be a uh, uh, modifications uh, keep on happening in future also. We'll have a, a injector which can go sub two millimeter very soon and having a very effective uh, management of uh, uh, cases with uh, astigmatism, toric eye wells. Now they're available up to four diopter correction. It will be available for a higher uh, degree of uh, 
uh, toricity in the cornea also. Along with that, uh, looking for a future generation IOLs, panoptics, which is trifocal lens. I think the future is still is to look for a, a better lenses which can have a really accommodative features, and that will be a day where you will have a best outcome for these uh, patients. Apart from that, uh, the IOLs materials should be such which should last the time. That means it should not have a, uh, too much of glistening. The IOLs should remain clear lifelong. And it should also maintain the good uh, relationship with the posterior capsule, that is the capsular biocompatibility, as well as UVL compatibility is also required for these lenses. I think looking to all these regions, we are on the right path, and I think uh, the future directions will be there for us to have a better and better system. Thank you, all the speakers, and thank you, uh, people being in this hall during the lunchtime also. Thank you all. And sorry for our next session, people. We have taken some time.